and hello! Welcome to Diane Writes. I'm so glad to see you guys here. Thanks so much for the raid time pool. Awesome. Okay, I was just checking uh, make sure my audio was working there. It sounds fine on my stream manager, so I'll just hand that over there. I have a special guest today, a good friend of mine, Sarah Berman. She's the author of the Rune Spell series. And since we're talking nano prep, and this week the prep work is all about plotting, I was just enamored of a wonderful video that uh, Sarah did on plotting for pantsers. And I think this is awesome because I suck with plotting. I cannot outline to save my life. I took a course on, uh, um, I took like uh, James Patterson's writing course, and he's a plotter, and I couldn't do half the course because. It's all about outlining, but her system's so simple and it makes sense. Welcome, and I'm so glad you could be here. Hello. <laughs> so yeah, tell us all about it. Where do we start? <laughs> okay, well, it's really actually quite simple. It's literally about taking your story in whatever form you have it at this time and putting it into the basic concept of a story arc. And okay. the, yeah. the version that I find the most helpful is actually a nine point plot out. Um, and, but I mean, you know, there's, there's like, there's three point, there's five point, there's, I've seen a 27 point. Yeah, that sounds like little, too much work. <laughs> yeah, that's a little much for even me. But what it does is if you if you need a direction to go, it helps keep you on task because we've all had those things where we write these gorgeous, gorgeous scenes. And then we're like, but where do I put it? <laughs> yep. Go anywhere. So it helps avoid that. But it also helps you take, like if you, if you do write gorgeous, gorgeous scenes and then you compile it into a story, it helps you figure out what order to put them in right because you don't always necessarily get to pick chronological and and sometimes you do but you know there are really good stories out there that are not chronologically ordered so you know that is not at all a limiting factor but um so yeah nine point outline and it follows the basic three point plot structure so you have the beginning the middle and the end yada yada now, right. the way I do it is, do you want me to just go ahead and launch into the point? I would love it if you would do that. This is this is great for me because, for me, the story starts at the scene. Something comes to me and I'm like, yes, yes. And then I, the rest of the story is, how did that happen? And then what does it mean? Right? So, yep. yeah, let, if you're willing, let's do it. Okay, so uh, point one is... You know, it, I call it Act One. You know, well, Act One. It's the beginning of Act One. Um, you're setting the scene. So, you know, all of the world anvilites will know this as world building. Um, it's yeah. as short or as long as you need it to be. And that is the best advice that I can give, by the way, for any description ever. Make it as short or as long as it needs to be for the story. And keep in mind Stephen King's advice. Most backstories are boring. Sorry. <laughs> it just, they are. You have to know them, but they're boring. Um, yeah. <laughs> you don't write the story about the backstory. There's a reason for that. Um, so, you, you know, you, you, you set the scene. And that can be, you know, a lot of people like to do like a little action sequence where, you know, they're kind of moving through their everyday life kind of thing. Maybe something exciting is actually happening, but it's more or less their everyday life. You know, uh, for example, I'm going to um, take from Disney's Aladdin because a lot of people have seen that. You have Aladdin running through the marketplace stealing food, right? Right. It's action, but it sets the scene. It tells you what kind of person he is, where he's coming from, and it's pretty much a day-to-day -day thing for him. So even right. though it's kind of exciting, it's still just what he does. So, you know, that's the kind of thing you want to do for that. And again, 
you know, I've seen them as short as a paragraph. I've seen them as long as several chapters. Um, anybody who's read the Wheel of Time series knows that you can get a prequel that is over 100 pages. Just say, <laughs> don't do that, please. It hurts. Uh -huh. It hurts so good. But um, So the second point is actually what I call plot point number one. Okay. And it is still within Act One. This is the specific thing that happens to the character. And that's very important because most of the time our stories are about thing, something happens to these characters and then they go on an adventure because of this thing. You know, the, the stars have aligned, the sword in the stone has been found, um, somebody attacks your village, uh, the the king has died long live the new king if you can ever find him oh look you're the heir oops <laughs> you know, something, something happens externally classic fantasy yeah change. right so it, it but it is it's the it's the um oh my gosh the word ran away by word there you go uh, and <laughs> the instigating action thing there's a specific term and no, oh my gosh it just ran I can see it running around. It's like a little three-year-old running around in my living room. But anyways, it's it's that it's that thing that the inciting that incident. The action. You have to have that. Right, the inciting so, incident, perhaps. Thank the, you. You're welcome. Oh my <laughs> Instigating, exciting. Yeah. Yeah, those yeah. using the uh, hero's journey model will recognize that as the call to adventure as well. That's another term that <laughs> my can be used. is still buffering. <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. Can I interrupt you for a question? Anything. Okay. Yeah. All right. Moonflower Anything. asks, so I tend to write from beginning to end of the story because I can't seem to connect the scenes together if they aren't written that way. Is there any mm -hmm. advice that either one of us have for fixing her need to write in that order. It's honestly a problem at this point because if I can't think of what happens between X and Y, I can't actually move on with the story. I had this problem so hardcore and honestly having a basic plot when I started helped because right. I knew where I needed to go and sometimes it was just, hey, I'm just going to jump over here and and go into the next big scene and something about that scene is going to trigger how we even got there you know what right. needs to happen next oh well how do you get there well you drive you know, i i set my a lot of my stuff in contemporary world contemporary world paranormal right <laughs> so you know we drive a lot <laughs> but, good you know, how, how do you get there? sometimes it's just as simple as saying uh, somebody left a message at the inn and now we walked there. You know, right, it doesn't have to be yeah. complicated. Tra transitions can be a pain in the butt. Yeah. Sometimes you just gotta, yeah, you know what, he fell asleep. I tend to think of my stories in chronological order too. And mm -hmm. what I have to keep in mind, and I try to do this, is not everything is part of the story. Just because it's part of the events that happen and you have to be aware of them doesn't mean that it's part of the story. So you can you can do a little bit of info dump. You can do a little bit of a description. They were there and then they got here. Two years mm -hmm. passed and then this happened. You know, you really can do that. It's really okay. Right. So yeah. when I keep that in mind and sometimes I don't get that till the editing, but, you know, like when you're reading it back, you realize what's slow paced and what isn't. And you're and then you think to yourself, do I need all this shit? Right. And if you don't, you can go, no. Right. And then you can cut it out. So that's how I personally deal with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I don't know if that and helps Moonflower. You know, I mean, the thing is, uh, one of the, the things that I've noticed that a lot of authors put a lot of pressure on themselves for is to keep the the action so high all the time and uh, you know quite frankly readers don't want that right we want you know we want the sine wave go with the sine wave the slightly up curving sign I can never remember which way because slightly up curving sine wave so that you know we we do have those breaths between action because we we want that. We want to be able to go, oh, thank goodness. Okay, now we're going again. 
oh, it's over. It's over. Yes, we oh, need oh, breathing no, no, room. We need time like for the events to absorb, to realize what has happened and process them, right? Uh, Blue oh. Sky Blackbird says Frodo was in his village, then he was in Mortar, and he's back at the end. Well, yeah, because the journey back wasn't really part of the story, right? It's not important. So you don't have to include it. You say he got back, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, for, for something to be cut in the story with seven endings. You know, <laughs> really yeah, exactly. Yeah, too right. But, yeah, it, well, and another way to think about it is, um, you know, each time you write an action sequence, each time you write a tension sequence, each time you write those really good scenes, you want your readers to get an adrenaline hit. Yes. How can they have an adrenaline hit? If the last bout of adrenaline hasn't left their system yet, you got to give them, give them time to get that out of their system a little bit and then hit them again. Just like real life. If too much happens, one thing after another, you just get fatigued after a while and you're like, oh, exactly. big deal. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, that's, that's the kind of the thing about this plotting, you know, situation, because it kind of builds that in in a larger like you want the smaller stuff in between as well but it kind of builds in the larger curves right just naturally so anyways back to the points can so, i can i stop you again sorry i know hold on to, hold on to the thought i really do want to get on with it but moonflower had uh commentary right um she adds i think i just have trouble in transitions between side plot and main plot etc for example i had a plot plan to get to the first main plot point by chapter five i was on chapter 14 without the first ma big main plot because i just couldn't transition right the story has since been scrapped but it happened i do that too let sarah take you through her method i'm sure it will help right well yeah and because <coughs> excuse me that you really want to ensure is for a subplot to make sense it really has to have a lot of connection to the main plot you know uh you have a romantic subplot in a murder mystery there is a reason that those two people are together you know whether they're working together whether they suspect each other you know whatever there's a reason it has to be connected so those interactions then become entwined in fact, um, I would suggest that you should actually make it pretty much a, a, a strong effort for a reader to pick apart what is specifically main plot and what is subplot. That's cool. It should be that important. You know, so, I, yeah. I made the reverse mistake, right? Um, I'm currently doing an edit on A Few Good Elves, right? Which you know about right and uh i'm i'm looking at an edit and a critique that i got from a friend another writer whose opinion i really respect and um he was saying that in a lot of cases i had characters that were really important in the beginning of the story and then they just disappeared and the reason why they disappeared is because i cut out their subplots i was looking at it and it was like this is way too much this book's too big is this really important to what's actually going on? But the answer is yes. Yes, it actually is important because their plot sheds light on the main plot, right? And I guess gives it a sense of scale. So now I'm in the process, as we speak, of putting that back in. And uh, yeah, so don't do that, right? Don't cut out the subplot thinking it's not important if it is. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. If, you're, if you're cutting out... Uh, whole sections like that, don't delete them. Yes. You know, cut them into another document, you may want to go back. Never delete anything. Save it. You might be able to use it later. I, I even do that when I have sections I, that I, I'm cutting. I put them in a different document and call call it, you know, a few good L sections, right? And I might come back to it later. Great. Anyway, yes, thank you. Please do go on. Plot point one. That's where we were. Okay. Yes. Plot point one is the... You know the instigating action the uh, and you said it and i promptly forgot it uh inciting incident Thank yes you. It's, it's fine <laughs> i forget this stuff too <laughs> one, one too many hits in the head with a snake right <laughs> yeah that was reference. <laughs> but um yeah so you have you have the inciting incident so you've set a a relatively stable you know life situation with these characters or character, you know, whether you have one or more. Right. 
and then you you shake the the snow go snow globe and so number three is the second act which seems a little hurried but trust me it works okay yep yeah. so point three is the second act we are now on a journey that journey can be a psychological journey it can be an emotional journey it can be a relationship journey it can be a quest for a sword it can be you know Eh. you know insert metaphorical or literal journey here you are now on your journey now the thing about journeys is in and of themselves starting a journey is an exciting thing so you don't have to do a lot at the beginning of the journey and you see this so much in stories where you know they're just starting a journey that's what the whole thing is. You have the hobbitses walking through the Shire. They're they're just do do do. Oh my gosh, we're on a journey. This is the furthest I've ever been from home. Blah blah blah. You know, right? That's what they do. That is the exciting part. So what you're doing is you're essentially setting up the interactions between any characters that are now on this journey together, because even if they knew each other before. Once you're road tripping with somebody, your your relationship changes. I mean, come on. All of a sudden, you realize they cannot sing. <laughs> <laughs> not wrong. Yeah, truth. <laughs> truth. So, yeah. and, 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 you know, then, then that guy over there who is so cool and laid back has to pee every five minutes. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you have to reestablish all of these relationships within the context of this journey and you know kind of how the journey is supposed to go and i say supposed to because you know it's how the journey is going to progress in general except for all of the times that you shake it up which is going to be most of the time so you know how it's supposed to go right. yes are we there yet yeah <laughs> yes. always that one guy yeah. they, they never say it when you're actually on the journey it's always like two minutes after you leave are we there yet <laughs> exactly okay, you're like no <laughs> so that that's the third part you're establishing this new reality where I, this I, thing has happened some shock has occurred i think new this reality. is great and i don't think i i think thank you for emphasizing the it changes the relationship between the characters that's something that i think is often neglected Right. And people, you know, start with like the five man superhero band. You know, they've seen too many anime. I don't know. Anime is cool. Anime is cool. But if your characters are, are, the, are the, you know, not in the process of changing at this point, then you need to think about why this is important. Right. Because if something important happens, it changes who we are. So I think that's excellent. Well, and, you know, really the best stories are. Like, you know, you you were talking about the, the five friends superhero group. Right. Well, okay, so the um the second Incredibles movie, which was incredible. Yeah, it was. It was an excellent movie. Yeah. But what happened? I mean, literally the inciting incident was that their family dynamic had to shift. Yes. And so they had to relearn what it meant to be, you know, the husband, the wife, the mom, the dad, the the kids, you know, what all of those relationships meant shifted. And their interactions with each other show how that shifted. So, I mean, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to address uh, Blue Sky's point here. Uh, Blue Sky said, and to be fair, the change might often be more important than the actual plot. It might even be the focus of the story. That is what they call a character driven narrative. And it's something that editors and publishers are looking for. Right. So that is yes. that is uh, that is an important point. If it doesn't change the characters, who cares about what the events are? Right. If the characters aren't driving the narrative by their reactions and their decisions, then it's you know i mean it, it it's cool but it's you know it, it's it, if you want to go beyond and make the story that's going to resonate with people that they're going to read and reread and come back to you want to pay attention to that yeah yeah uh, although uh okay to put a twist on that yeah it is super fun to take a character who's just too stubborn to change and force them to change yes <laughs> Oh, shaking up your life isn't going to change you. 
How about if I destroy it? <laughs> yes, right. Sadism among authors. It's great. Yeah, I'm seeing some sadism among authors in the chat for sure. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So that that's essentially the the third point is you you want to establish kind of the new normal for this journey. Right. And again, journey can be metaphorical. Journey can be anything. Uh, character driven journeys are beautiful. Mwah. Love them. Um, you know, a lot of mainstream fiction is based on that concept. So if you want to learn more about that, read up on some mainstream fiction or, you know, movies that are more mainstream fiction. Like, I'm trying to think of an example that's modern that doesn't eat, pray, love. <laughs> uh, the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, I suppose, would be a good one. Uh, right now, really, the the one that I find the most dramatic in my brain right now is Prince of Tides. That's pretty old. Mm. Anyway. Yeah, I hear you. I just um, reread Watership Down, which oh. is my favorite book. I reread it at least once every 10 years. And that is an excellent example. Right, The characters mm -hmm. drive the narrative, their decisions, and their uh, refusal to make decisions in some cases drive the plot and the plot changes them as characters and they grow <clears throat> it's uh and it's about rabbits you would think right y you know if you don't know right but those who've read rabbits. it know <laughs> they they call them rabbits yes they're actually what uh political systems political systems metaphors for different sorts of human beings yeah at um uh, characters out of myth yeah all of that all of that. It's one of the things that makes a great book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the the boys, I, I I have to watch that in slow bursts because um, I empathize way too much mm. with uh, visual media characters. So um, I, I find it, it really challenging too fast. because it is so emotional. Yeah. I, I have, oh, yeah. I think well, I've seen two episodes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm working on it, but yeah. Um, but hey, it can be even be simpler. The Mandalorian, okay? The Mandalorian is like the simplest basic Western plot in the world, right? It's a cliche. It's such a... But the, the Mandalorian, you know, he changes over the course of the uh, of the story, yeah. right? And uh, he grows. You know, I, I'm, I'm laughing, but only because my grandfather was a fan of Westerns and I just keep thinking, I don't remember Baby Yoda starring next to John Wayne. <laughs> And, you know, once you visualize that, you can't unsee that. There's a lot of that as subplots in the Marvel Universe, too, says Dinosaur Bob. And, yes, it's one of the things that makes it a great story. It's why we watched all these damn movies for ten bloody years. It's why we cared about the end mm -hmm. of the story and why we want to see what happens now. Yeah, because well, each of these characters were developed. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they did a really good job, and, I mean... Truth be told, the characters we care about the most are the ones that had the most um, psycho-emotional changes. Yes. You Absolutely. Know, I mean, seriously, Iron Man is a... The, the Iron Man arc is a study in PTSD and how not to deal with it. Yes. Conversely, right, uh, um, uh, Cap... Right is a great study in PTSD and eventually how to deal with it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So oh, although he did, he had trouble ever letting go. And, that's true. And that was, but that was his. That was his thing. Yeah, you know, like he well, and it made sense for his character because if you never give up the fight, then when you completely lose the fight, how do you let that go? Captain America has a good lesson in hope punk. Yeah. But anyway, do go on. Yes. Okay. We're on the journey. We're, we're learning about the characters and each other. Their relationships are changing. Yeah. And, and let's face it. We could do eight hours of just discussion on the MCU characters. Totally anyway. could. Okay. So point number four is, it, well, it's the midpoint. The, the difficult part, the one that people often describe as the mushy middle. Uh, yes. Um, 
the okay well the entire second act tends to be the mushy middle because people people love the the world creation people love the inciting incident you know drama thing happens do do and people love the climax but the build up to the climax it, that's the entire thing is the mushy middle the midpoint is a very specific point in time and the best way I've heard it described is it is the point in time where the character, the main character, stops letting things happen to them and starts being the active force in their life. Awesome. So, um, you know, uh, not being chased around, deciding to stand and fight, that would be a, a midpoint decision um choosing to use the force to you know get their their quest complete that would be an active thing um you know like a, a lot of times the active thing is that thing in the middle of the movie where you're sitting there going yes because yes. the main character has finally you know pulled their head out their butts <laughs> and Stop, stopped being this almost uh, victim of circumstance. Right. And it's now, you you can now see that they <coughs> are actually on that path to success. Whether right. they achieve that success or not is another thing, but yeah, you know, they're on that path. So that is the midpoint. You want that that thing that happens, you know, and, and a lot of the times, like, um, I believe in Wonder Woman, that path, that that particular change happened with the No Man's Land scene. And yes. It is still talked about. Yes, one of the point. most moving scenes in any movie I've seen in recent years, actually. And it's just a, mm -hmm. you know, it's just a superhero movie, right? Except that Wonder Woman was all of us. Right. So we recognize yeah. that point where we're like, OK, you know, I'm 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 not. I, I need to do something. I'm going to step forward. I'm going to do something. Yes, I know it's dangerous. I don't care. I'm doing it anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, cue the waterworks. Yes. I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that's the midpoint. And that is point number four on this nine point outline. Um. And, you know, really the thing is that's really all that can be said about it because it is so specific to the character and the story that you're writing that it's kind of hard to say anything else about it. You know, just do that thing that turns your character upside down. So, okay, number five is essentially um, act two revisited. Okay. So you're going back to the journey, but with the twist that now the main character is an active player in this journey. Right. You know, they are no longer being led along by the wizard mentor. They are no longer being guided by the, the Jedi master. Um, they are an active participant in this journey. They're making decisions. They're taking that active role. <clears throat> and, you know, in relationships, this is that point in time when when the person has decided what they want to do. You don't have to army crawl across the floor. They know you're here. <laughs> this would be the hubby. Hello, hubby. No. no. Uh, th this this would be the monster baby. Oh, the monster baby. Yes. <laughs> yeah, monster baby. She has very dirty feet. <laughs> you know what? Yesterday. This is Twitch, not ABC. We can have kids. It's fine. You know? <laughs> so... <laughs> <clears throat> mm. So yeah, so now you have the you're you're revisiting this journey from the perspective of a main character who is actively involved. So you have all of the you know all of the things that have happened, you know, kind of play into this, but that is the main difference between Act Two the first time and Act Two the revisit. This Got it. So now he's readdressing. They are addressing all the same problems. But now they're addressing it from their changed perspective as an active participant. So they're not being dragged through mm -hmm. it. And maybe, you know, now they're making their own choices. So it changes the outcome. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Um, now the fun part is that uh, you have uh, the, where am I on? You, you, this is, uh, we're on number yeah, six. We're on number six. Yeah, <laughs> number that was five. Six. Yeah. I, I know where we're at in the arc, but I can, I always lose count. So number six is the second plot point. Right. And this, this one's a little bit trickier because what you want is a situation where you have the character taking ownership of their narrative. They are, they are guiding their own story. They are making those decisions. They are doing stuff. And it smacks them in the face like a rake that you, stu that you stepped on in the yard. Yes. I mean, whack. You want, you want them hit hard because, you know, you're, you're about to go into this dark night of the soul, questioning everything that you've done since, you know, the first point way back when. This, this is where you're heading. You want these, these things to just mess up hardcore. You have, you've saved the princess, but, you know, Obi-Wan has been killed. Right. You you're you're literally in a position where even if you have made any successes, it seems like the cost has been way too high. Your your life is falling apart. Things are just mm, it, it you you want you want those things to happen. You do not want your main character su to succeed at this point. Right. It may not it may not be the first time they've they've taken control and, and tried something that you know they may have had a small success here and there, you know, over the course of the story progressing. Because again, these these things can be really long. These each of these points can be really long sections. So but this is the point where you want their decisions, their the the characters are questioning everything about themselves whether they are capable, whether they are competent, whether they truly even understand what they're doing, whether they have the skills to, to beat the bad guy. They want, you know, we're questioning everything. Right. And that's that's what you're hitting them with right then. Yeah, the dark night of the soul. You know, uh, yeah. this is the point on, you know, when they do the story graph and it's doing this. Now we've gone, that's, that's that point. Yeah. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're they're. Um, it, this isn't the actual low part of the story. This is what triggers the low part of the story. So, gotcha. Then we go on to point seven, which is Act Three. Cue the sad music. Okay. Da, 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 da. Your one true love is dead. Your mentor is being tortured. Um, <laughs> um, Morpheus has been kidnapped by, you know, the agents. Oh, what are we going to do? You you know you're not the one. Da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is emo phase. Awesome. Emo phase. I'm going to totally and remember you that. you want to dig into this. Yeah. Because the more your character feels as though they can't do it, the greater the tension is when they attempt to do it later. Right. So, whew. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I love the, I love the emoting there. That's great. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, sec, uh, point, point seven, uh, the beginning of act three, you're going full on emo. And then you know, somebody gives like a pep talk or something, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, all of a sudden, maybe, just maybe you can do it. And, yeah. Because, I mean, th this this point, I probably should break it up into two because it kind of has two sections because you have the entire you, you, you plummet down to the, to the depths, but then you have to come back up in right. order for you to continue. So you also have, you know, the pep talk, you know, the coach in the locker room scene where, yeah, you know, we're like 300 points behind and it's hockey. So you're probably only going to make two points. <laughs> it's hockey. You can win those two points. Oh my God. I can't even. Okay. Sorry. I, I, I just had a Canadian trauma moment. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's brilliant. Oh my God, that's great. Okay. Yeah, but it has to seem so, that impossible is basically what you're telling us. Right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you, you have, you have uh, the characters are essentially scrambling for um, everything that they possibly can in terms of hope or determination, you know, like uh, really common is the fact that, oh, look, you're your child has been kidnapped and is going to be murdered because it doesn't matter how low you are, you're taking somebody out for that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, that, that's, that's one way to do it. Another way is, you know, Hey, even if we lose, we lose as winners or, you know, <laughs> yeah. weird thing. So that's where you're at with this point. Point number eight. So easy. The climax. Yeah, it pretty much writes itself by this point if you've been carrying yeah. on. Big yep. bad fight, the big game, the big reveal, the big kiss, the big, you know, whatever. Um, this is when you're going to have your, your harshest plot twist. Okay, because that's interesting. During yeah. The, well, during the climax, you know, you, you have to have that moment where you've you finally got it figured out. You've overcome the worst uh, of the worst. And then plot twist, I am your father. Yes. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler. I'm but sure I, everyone's yeah. seen that by now. <laughs> yeah. uh, so so you, you find out something that makes, it can make the victory hollow. It can be that, you know, that person that you never thought you could count on actually was reliable hello han solo uh-huh um yeah the, there something happens that you did not expect and it has to be something pretty big because that adds on to the uh tension to the excitement you know kind of depending on what it is but you want your biggest twist to happen here gotcha because nothing screws up a big fight like oh by the way <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. Awesome. Um, and then number nine, also super easy. You know, all of those threads that you've been making and tugging on and interweaving for the entire story, you got to tie all those up. And I say gotcha. all, but like if you have a sequel, you know, you might want to lo- leave a little a little uh, looser than others. You, you know, there, there might be some that just kind of float off into the ether because they really weren't all that important. Right. And, you know, use a short story to clean them up or something. I don't know, whatever. But for the most part, you want to tie them up. And the reason for this is because the single most hated ending in all of writing ever is the cliffhanger. Yep, 100%. Like, okay, no, actually, I, I, know, I know people, I know people are going to argue about this. Uh-huh. I know it. But there is a difference between leaving something available for a sequel and a cliffhanger ending. Yes. Because okay, I was just is, about to ask about that. How do you differentiate? Oh, that's a tricky thing, right? Um, your main plot for the story has to be tied up. Now, here's the thing, though. If you are planning on writing a series, your main plot for the series and your main plot for that story may be mistaken for each other. Uh-huh. Especially in the first book. Because yes. the first book, you're setting up the main plot for the series as well as the main plot for that book. I run into this problem, right? Because uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, the Toy Soldier Saga is one big story. It's a bit like Lord of the Rings. It's not done at the end of the first book. So I can't have everything uh set up and done i can't have brought back all the characters yet because they aren't important again until book two or three you know so yeah yeah i get you so so you need to decide what plot points what what parts make it a single book rather than part of a series yes and that's what you need to tie up so yeah, th- those are kind of nuancey things, and where you kind of get more into the art versus science aspect yeah. of writing. 
you know, sometimes you just, you know what should be series and you know what should be book. You can plan it. Um, I, I do try to plan it. But, um, you know, the, the big thing is the series that I'm writing is a nine book series. Yep. Interestingly, I have nine points in a plot series. So... But I can't. It does do seem to be sort of ninth book, so I kind of have to that way. these plot points even further. Yeah, no, I, it, I, I see it. I see it in the in the structure. I've of course read the Rune Spells and big fan. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. so each book, you know, it's like not only am I figuring out the the plot of that book, any subplots that might be going on in that book, but also, okay, and what needs to happen for the main plot or the main series plot in this book gotcha and sometimes it's not going to be very much gotta admit that yeah but something has to happen or else you know it's just tertiarily connected you know really so but yeah you you want to tie things up and you want to tie them up satisfactorily now the huge thing is satisfactorily is not the same thing as happily ever after thank you good point not all stories end happy ways but they are concluded, um, at least sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so there, there was a movie about twenty years ago called Lost Souls, starring Winona Ryder. Okay, yeah, I remember it. Uh, do you remember the ending? Uh, yeah, it was it was quite the downer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was satisfactory. Yeah, it it was concluded. It, like you you felt the angst of it, but it was an appropriate ending to that story and you knew it even if you didn't want it to be that way that's right you knew it was an appropriate ending yeah that that is key it has to be an appropriate ending lord of the it rings is be a happy ending lord of the rings is like that too when you read the books as opposed to the movies the movies they tried more of the happy thing i guess because hollywood likes it better i don't know but in uh in the end of the the books there was the scouring of the shire the war had come home to the shire and it was never the mm -hmm. same again and you know frodo was never the same again and you know but it was concluded right it was actually yeah. quite sad yeah 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 and, and that's that's the other thing that you need to keep in mind with your your uh resolution section um you're concluding the story that is supposed to change your main characters like significantly these are life-changing things whether they you know have psychological trauma or they're, you know, they become a king or they become, you know, but something happens to this person, their life in some way will never be the same again. Right. And you have to show that. That is the key to your character's development is they have changed. So essentially what you're doing is you're wrapping everything up, but you're also showing their new normal. They now have, you know, we're back to point one, essentially. You have a new normal life and it is it's it's really cool like with some stories how you can kind of reflect it like it's almost a a distorted mirror image of the first scene right because you know they they may be trying to be back as as the same person but it's not quite right or they may be trying to retain some of their, their past in this new situation they find themselves in or, you know, you know, whatever, but kind of having that little callback to the beginning where, yeah, this is the same person, but they have been changed significantly. That's always really cool. What I don't like is um, if you saw the movie, Hannah. I didn't, I'm the, afraid. The girl who was the assassin chick. Um, essentially the, the final scene, which kind of doubled as the climactic scene was virtually identical to the opening scene. And I didn't like it at all. I thought it felt forced. So, um, you know, there was, it, it did show uh, a lot of changes, but I, it didn't feel like a natural ending. So it was not a satisfactory ending to me, but it did show a, 
a technique of ending a story, which is called book ending. So right. you, you essentially have virtually identical things on either side of the story, <clears throat> which is a fabulous technique if you pull it off correctly. Sometimes but you can do that, that with things like flash forwards at the beginning of the book, right? right. Where you're yeah. actually at the end scene. Tarantino movies do this, right? They start with the end scene and then the rest of the movie is how they got to that scene. It can work. Yeah. But you have to have a few twists in there in order for that to work, I think, effectively. Yeah. You know, um, okay, so I'm going to be slightly critical. Have at it. Like Quentin Tarantino movies, so don't get me wrong on this. Yep. But um, I, I kind of feel like the flash forward scenes are best used if you don't have enough interesting things happening in the beginning. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And that's fine. There's so nothing it, wrong with it, that. Well, it's it's good if if you know that, you know, you're looking at your story and you're like, yeah, this starts out really slow. How can I fix it? Well, you know, a, a flash forward is a technique to fix that. And it can be quite effective. Um, people, not my favorite. Though, yeah, so. people, people <laughs> can also. Personal. No, no, that's cool. Right. Actually, I, I don't I think that's uh, that's good. Uh, there, there's a suggestion if you feel like your beginning is crawling. Right. Yeah. This is a way to do it. And mm -hmm. um, but but be careful. They don't give away too many spoilers at the beginning then. Right. And spoil yeah. the rest of the story. There are I don't. OK. Right now, uh, movie trailers. Right. They seem to come in two varieties and I hate them both. OK. One is we're going to tell you the whole fucking story. So you don't have to watch any of it because you already know what all happens. Or we're going to show you a couple of quick, uh, you know, flashes like we're trying to give you a seizure of meaningless scenes that have no connection to each other or anything and give you no idea what the damn st story is about. You know, come on. Can, can we can we like do an inciting incident and then do a couple of these flashy action scenes so you don't really know right at least you have some idea of the plot i don't i don't know what's the matter right i, I it's very difficult to get me to go to the movie theater lately and this is one of the reasons why yeah 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 i mean it, it th those are facts you know um giving away too much well and you know this kind of goes into writing your blurb but uh g giving away too much and I've seen a lot of this where, you know, people like to either write the blurb as, oh, look, here's the entire backstory of my character. Please, God, make it stop. Yep. Whichever God it happens to be listening, make it stop. Or the other one is, uh, I'm just going to summarize the entire story. No. Well, why did <clears throat> I buy the book? Then? Right. Exactly right. Yeah, I'm terrible with blurbs, by the way. This is why I get other people to help me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, and, you know, I mean, the thing is, I, I get it. It's hard. It's hard to to explain to people why they should care about the character without explaining all the nuances of what this character is and has gone through. And, yeah, I get it. It is so, so hard. But, you know. Yeah, and it's hard for us as authors because we love our characters so much to go, yeah, you know, that's not really that important. We think it's important, but the reader well, isn't going to give a shit because it doesn't have a thing to do with the plot, right? Yeah, and and I mean, let's be realistic here. It's You're not writing a blurb to include all the important things. You're writing a blurb to get your your potential readers excited about it. Yes, yes, this is, a, you're right. This, see, this is another thing. This is an advertisement, right? It's it's a, it's a an advertisement. It's a movie trailer. It's a poster, right? It's not mm. meant to be the, the summation of your great literary work. It's, it's a commercial, right? So yep. treat it like it's a commercial. <laughs> Get people interested. Yeah. Yes, and whatever you do, do not include the big twist. Oh, God, oh. yes. Don't put your big twist in the blurb. Please. I know. Yeah. Uh, oh. Mm. Okay. I'm okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Mm -hmm. I feel your well, pain. I, I mean, you're you're right there with me. It, I I love the fact that there are so many indie authors. Yep. But there are so many indie authors, and some of them don't do everything very well. Like. They might be yeah. really great at writing a story, but really bad at blurbs. And you end up with this whole, like, 
smorgasbord of just things where you're just like, yeah. And I say that knowing that it's easier to criticize than to actually do it yourself. Yes. Like, I, I, I criticize things knowing full well that, you know, I, I tend to do the same thing and have to beat myself up. Yeah, elevator pitches are hard. And the weird thing is that um, this is the, the line between uh, indie and traditional publishing in this respect is changing because of the way the traditional publishing industry is working. We have to do more and more of that for ourselves. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Even even if you're traditionally published, you're expected to do most of the marketing for your audience. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I have a knock at the door. Uh, hold on just a moment, guys. We will be right back. In the meantime, I believe Sarah's laid out most of her, uh, you know, the framework. If you have any questions, this is a great time to ask them. We'll be right back. And we're back. Sorry about that. I probably should have left some music running or something. <laughs> I hear my own voice in the background now because apparently Aaron was watching the stream. So um, I think you're still muted there, Sarah. Yeah. Yes, I was tippy tapping. Oh, that makes sense. Tippity tappity. Yes, I love doing mental trauma stuff. I did a um, what is that? Uh, I don't understand what that's right. K 
Okay, male trans male uh, paranormal erotica where the trans male was learning his identity without any real basis or vocabulary. Typical fantasy Brit setting. It turned out well. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, Esau would rather just listen to the tippity tappity, but that's, you know, <laughs> a little Leia Samar there, I guess, but yeah. Cool. So did anybody have any questions for Sarah or myself or, you know, any, uh, ah, okay. Uh, Siobhan says he is currently finding it harder and harder to even look at his reflection. He's also masquerading as a woman because his mentor is missing and he has been placed in the healer's collegium to learn about the healing arts and they have to be women, I guess. Right. Which, you know, I know because I, I know the context of the story, but yeah. Yeah. And, well, okay. So yeah, to, to address that, um, I would, because each individual's experiences have enough variety and nuance, you know, I, I try to understand what the general stuff is in particularly like body dysphoria kind of things, but mostly I focus on in the actual writing, the individual's experience. So like, you know, fears of being discovered and the the kind of uh, shock, recoil, uh, almost disgust of seeing that, you know, you look in the mirror and you haven't changed, even right. though you really just wish you would, you would, you wish you were different and you wish you were changed and then, you, dang it, you're not changed yet. You know, <laughs> so, um, you know, the, those kinds of thoughts and feelings really exploring that and digging in um nightmares are a really great way to bring that in and you know just discussions where you know somebody like okay masquerading as a woman uh i would say that that would be I'm assuming it's a, it's a trans man who is masquerading as a woman. A uh, trans woman, actually. Siobhan is a trans woman herself, and it's an own voices story. So, okay, so so it's it, she's it's using the his would... because he the character appears male right now, and isn't quite okay. yet. They're discovering their identity and haven't quite discovered it yet. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that would be even more confusion bringing that hardcore into it. Like, is this just because I'm really invested in the masquerade or is it because I really feel like this, you know, that kind of exploration of the, the experiences that they are going through always, you know, you, you, you want that authenticity to come through and you do that by focusing on the individual experiences in, in my professional experience right that is that has what brought me successes in this and you know being a cis woman who occasionally writes lbgtq stuffs i try really really hard to get it right and i do stress about it so when people are like hey you did this great i'm like oh i'm going to take this comments and i'm going to pet it and feed it you do really amazing LBGTQ characters. I can Thank attest to you. that 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and again, you know, it just comes down to, uh, you know, there are, there are universal things that happen to all trans women. There are universal things that happen to all trans men. There are universal things. But they're not nearly as um, specific as maybe we like to pretend or assume mm -hmm. so the individual's experience really does just trump that and so honoring the truth of experience while honoring the individuality of experience is really just the best course of action although i would suggest that that would be true of all minorities i'd agree yeah so but um what, one of the things i did when if i can just go ahead and yeah. lasso this and change the subject. <laughs> <clears throat> um, one of the things that I, I do want to kind of do a rundown of is the difference between plotting as a plotter and plotting as a pantser. Awesome. This is what we're here so, for. Um, <laughs> the, okay, so the big difference is, you know, you, you have various stages of writing. Mm -hmm. And those stages include, you know, first draft, final draft, 
editing drafts, you know, three million of those between between three and three million. I'm on thirteen <laughs> now, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but then you also have outline. And the thing about outlining is it can either come before your first draft or it can come after your first draft. Yes. And that is the huge difference. Plotters do an outline so that they can get their first draft done. In a lot of ways, the outline functions as a first draft. Right. And it's about as clad in iron and, and written in stone as a first draft, which is to say it lasts until it doesn't. Yeah. So no, no matter what's, what type of writer you are, never, ever, ever assume that just because you have it in your outline, you have to stay, stick with it. A nope, good point. Sometimes you revisit the outline and you sit there, okay, this is way too good to not include, so I'm going to figure out how to include this, so I'm going to just stare at my outline until it makes sense. Yep, absolutely. Uh, James Patterson, he writes like this. His course was 90% about doing the outline. He spends more time on the outline than he does on the actual draft. By the time he gets there, he knows every point of the story scene by scene and has planned it all out. I could never function like this. This would totally yeah. just... I have tried, I really have, because I want to understand outlining. I feel it's important in case there's something there that I'm missing, or at the very least, then I can have, you know, an opinion that's intelligent that I can offer to people for whom that process works. But I cannot do it. It's, no, it just yeah. it won't well, happen. And, and that's the thing. I mean, we wouldn't want writers who all write the same way. Right. And, you know, like you said, he spends so much time on his outline. It literally functions as a first draft. He has spent all of his time on that first draft. Yep. And then he just adds all the words. And it works for him. He's one of the best-selling right. authors of our time. And he's and making money hand over fist, right? And he writes a good yarn. It's a good story. You know, I like his yeah. work. So, you know. Well, and what, really, honestly, what he does has a certain formula to yeah, it. Yeah, it does, too. Yep, that's so, a legitimate you know, that's, critique. That's why he writes so quickly, because he has this basic outline that he just fleshes out. And that's each new story is, you know, just fleshing it out, and then he can write it. So yep. um, when, you, when you write the outline after your first draft, what you're trying to do is give this big ball of mushy, what the heck did I just make, some structure. Yep. Yep. And so, I mean, really uh, taking, like, a lot of people use note cards where, you know, they'll they'll write down, okay, I wrote this scene, I wrote this scene, I wrote this scene. You know, so you write a note you know, on the note card, the a basic description of the scene. And then you, you look at these outline structures, whichever structure you've chosen, and you're like, okay, this card goes here, and this card goes here, and this card goes here. And yeah, that may mean you have to tweak some of the details in your writing in order to fit that. You may have to write some additional scenes for transition, that kind of thing. But what you're doing is you're giving it structure after the fact. In the video that you referenced, I actually describe outlining as a skeleton. Yes, for I liked this metaphor. Plotter, yeah, for plotters, your skeleton is a vertebrate skeleton. It's an internal skeleton. You build it and it it shapes your story from the inside out. And you know, they they do the facial reconstruction things on the skulls because the shape yeah. of the skull shows you how the the face would have looked kind of thing, which is by the way fascinating. But that's how your your plot works. It is a basic structure that you build your story on and give it guts and then you know make sure it doesn't exercise and then it becomes overweight and and the hair falls out and <laughs> <laughs> too far too far <laughs> that's awesome then it gets arthritic no okay yeah <laughs> with with pantsers what you're doing is um I, I don't know how many people here have taken biology but insects are essentially liquid inside and like to the point they don't even have veins they just have this heart that squirts blood throughout the body <laughs> yeah it's hilarious because that means if you turn them upside down the blood falls out of their heart bowl <laughs> yikes okay too much entertainment yeah too much sci-fi yes but um 
so what you're doing is you're taking this the mushy stuff that you've you've created that still has function i mean this is it's this is not at all meant to decide that one form is better than the other because they're not right and in fact done well you can't tell the difference between a plotted and a pants novel right so let's be completely clear about that but when you're you when you're doing the outline after the first draft you're taking the mushy stuff and you're you're shoving it into this exoskeleton yes <laughs> and making sure that all the stuff gets in the right place and giving it shape from the outside yes. and both of those things create perfectly viable biological creatures or novels as the case may be so that's that's what you're trying to do you're just trying to give your novel that shape and the reason for that is because, you know, it's like telling a joke. You can say the funny words, but if you say them in the wrong wor- way, it's really not funny. Right. You have to, you know, you have to do the delivery correctly or else it's not a joke. Same thing with a story. You have to do the delivery in a certain format in order to appeal to consumers because we really like the tension and the buildup and the climax and the resolution. We love that format. It appeals to our human brains or non-human yeah. brains is the case, maybe. Now who knows? <laughs> but, you know, that's, it, there's a reason that we have story structure. It's what works, period. Nobody has ever come up with an alternate story structure because guess what works? Story structure. Yep. It's even so, true yeah. of the ancient narrative poems. They all work like this too, right? They yeah. sometimes get I mean, lost in side quests more, but otherwise, yeah, it's the same deal. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, the, the thing is, how many times have you been disappointed in your life? Because if you really think about it, your life isn't following story structure. Well, that's a good point. That, that, that is a very interesting point, actually. That, yeah, that took a minute to fully yeah. process there. Yeah, you exactly. Know, There's supposed to be a life. satisfactory resolution here. Why the hell isn't it happening? I had this climax, this intense battle thing. I deserve to go back to the Shire and become mayor. That's right. That's it. But yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, we 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 don't we don't live in a story structure world because you know things aren't that neat and tidy. Don't make your stories into too real world and make them untidy and un- unstructured because it just it it's not appealing. Every and now and then, there's some artsy writer that tries to break that, and I never find it satisfactory. It's fun to read in the same way that an interesting. Uh, I don't I don't know when you're when you're looking at a particularly well done poem and it, a sonnet right and you're like oh well, look at how interesting it is that they made it fit within the sonnet kind of thing but it may it, but it isn't a satisfactory story generally right and the reason why it tends to get attention from critics is because critics get bored right they they see and or read so many different things that they're just looking for something that's different but yeah the average reader probably doesn't appreciate that. You know, they're like, what the fuck's going on here? You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, let, let's be honest. A a section of prose that doesn't have a plot structure is uh, unstructured poetry. Yeah. And unstructured poetry is beautiful. I love it. I appreciate it. But it, it's it, not it a novel. Be, but it, you don't do it with the same intention. Right. So, yeah, but, um, you know, well, and you know, for a fact, even nonfiction has to have structure, Yes, a, a pretty specific structure in order to sell, because you can't, you can't just write a series of essays and call it anything other than a series of essays, because yeah. it's just not going to work. It's not going to work for people. You, you actually need structure. some of that story structure, even within uh a uh you know a non-fiction piece right as you and i both know since we're also non-fiction writers it's you, you kind of have to start with your premise and then you have to justify the premise and then you have mm-hmm. to come to your conclusion from all the stuff that you've done to justify the premise yeah right so it's still beginning middle end and an act right yeah 
and you save right. the juicy stuff for the climax point, right? You know, we still do it. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, the, the thing is with, with a story, you tend to do um, a chronological story, you know, beginning, oh, look, going on the adventure, climax, ending. That, that is the most basic story in the universe. You know, person goes on an adventure, person defeats the bad guy, person goes home and lives happily ever. With nonfiction, it's more like you have this idea and then you're constantly drilling down until you yes. get that really juicy tidbit. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, so instead of being linear, it's more... Um, I don't know, what do you call drilling down? Uh, Detail-oriented? Details? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I see what uh, you're saying like there. A, yeah. a matter, because, I mean, if you if you look at a lot of nonfiction, essentially it's just saying the same thing over and over and over again, just giving you more and more details. That's true. Yep. Yeah, I can't, uh, yeah, I can't even argue, right? And hopefully, because you're trying to teach something, basically, when you're writing right. nonfiction. So different people <laughs> learn in different ways. So you try to include a bunch of different approaches so that one or two things will click with each reader. Maybe everything won't, but at least one or two things, if you've done it right, they'll be like, oh, yeah, okay. Eureka, mm -hmm. I get it. Right? Yep. So, yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Okay, so. FYI, um, can you hear pretty much the, the noise oh. in the other room there? Can you hear? Uh, okay. Because it's driving Not me insane. Really. Okay, good. Okay, good. I'm the only one who's hearing it. Fine, then. I was just a little worried about it. I'm like, I should go in there and turn that down, but no. That's fine. Cool! Okay, so we're basically there, and I'm not seeing a lot of other questions here at the moment. Um, or comments, or you guys can ask anything, by the way. It doesn't have to be directly related. Um, Sarah's pretty approachable, so I'm sure she'll be quite happy to answer whatever questions. Um, but in the meantime, um, we're approximately at the halfway point of the stream that I usually do in this slot. Do you want to hang around and do some writing stuff with me, or do you have things you have to go do? Either oh, way is no, cool. Like I want to go hang out with my family. We are quarantined. <laughs> so I do not want to hang out with my family. Yeah, you're like, anything to get me out of here mentally for ten minutes, I'm fine! <laughs> <laughs> yeah fair enough uh, of course as soon as i shut this off and actually try to get my work done that's when they're all going to come and talk to me uh-huh hey you're quiet and sitting down for 10 minutes uh mom yeah no <coughs> isn't here right now yeah that's right there is no mom there's only zool that's right <laughs> Yeah, so keep it on and start writing. Yeah, that's kind of the plan, actually. Oh, <laughs> Makara says, sorry, distracted by torturing rats with kisses. <laughs> kind of like cats that don't want attention. They're like, no, and you're like, yes, I'm going to pat you right now. And they're like, ah. <laughs> It's hilarious. Yeah. Okay, in that case, if there are no further questions at this time, six rats, holy crap. Okay, Makara has six rats. That's a lot of rats. I love rats, so cute. Um, I think we'll take another quick break because this one is a planned one, right? Um, approximately 10 minutes. And that way, if you have to go and take care of bio issues like I do, then <laughs> we will go do that. And then we will come back and we'll do some writing sprints. And thanks so much. Oh, be, um, we'll do it again at the end of the, the show. But plug your stuff. Where do people find you? Oh, um, okay. So Practically Writing is my vlog. And for the video that we keep referencing, that is actually listed as episode 16. So episode 16, okay. So if you 16, go to okay. YouTube and look up Practically Writing, then you get my channel and you can just go through there. Yeah, I will I will um, find your link in the in the break so that I can put it up in the chat for people. Cause okay. or you can actually if you like. Either way. Yeah. Okay. Um also I am here on Twitch sometimes, uh still in the fumbling stage of figuring out how this stuff all works. 
but I am Author Goddess on Twitch. I am Author Goddess on Twitter. Uh, Author Goddess is also my website, and you can find me as Sarah Berman Author or Author Sarah Berman on Facebook and Instagram. And uh, my books are mostly on Amazon. I'm actually in the process of kind of moving away from Amazon uh -huh. for a lot of my stuff because, you know, I'm, I'm Cause Amazon. testing Jeff Bezos. He could share some of his money with me, you know. Yeah, instead of exploiting us and taking advantage of us, driving down the entire uh, price of the market and forcing all writers, even very successful ones, to work at bullshit jobs because they can't afford to just write. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm on Amazon, too. I have no choice. Well, we live yeah. in a corporate I mean, hell. I'm, I'm trying to get away from it, too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, pretty much everywhere. I, I do a lot of stuff. I'm going to be working with a few groups on online writers' conferences and uh, book conferences later on this year. So um, pretty much follow me around. And, oh, I do have a Discord. So if you're interested in that, um, you can find me there. Uh, if you go into my Facebook or just plain message me, I can give you the sign up for my newsletter and I include most of my links on all of those. Uh, I do a monthly newsletter, so it's not like I'm emailing you every day. I don't have time for that. Oh yeah. my God. I do not have time. People <laughs> who do weekly newsletters, I do not have I don't get how they have time for that. I gave up on the monthly newsletter. I uh -huh. found that I wasn't getting a lot of openings on it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm on social media and I'm really approachable. So people can talk to me there. I have a blog, you know, good yeah. enough. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and interestingly, um, apparently I'm pretty good at writing the copy on newsletters. Yes. Because like I send out a newsletter and in the newsletter, I'll be like, hey, how are you doing? let me know. And, you know, thinking that they're going to follow me on social media and, and stuff. No, they email me back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you write wow. a good, you do write a good newsletter. Actually, I enjoy your newsletter. So I'm on our list. Yay. So yeah. Cause I like so, to keep yeah. informed. It, it, it just, it makes me chuckle. Cause it's like, you know, newsletter, not, not personal email, but newsletter, you're going to respond. Okay. I, I'm working with I and I usually respond back. I'm like, hey, how you doing? Awesome. It, it just it, it makes me chuckle so hard. Yeah, that's it's interesting, especially because most people don't like get a lot of return from newsletters these days. It's cool that you get personal interaction. I think that's excellent. Yeah, I got to take some notes. Oh. I guess. <laughs> you know what? Here's one thing I meant to ask. I completely forgot to ask it. What you doing for Nano? Haven't figured it out yet. Um, I have an editing job, and uh, honestly, once that's done, I may end up with another editing job. It kind of depends on where he's at in the process. So um, I may be editing through Nano. It depends sure. on that. But if everything goes the way I want it to, I'll have these editing jobs done, and then I'll finish up Blood of the Moon, and then I will be able to randomly decide what I'm going to do next. I have no idea. I understand completely. Like I've said repeatedly, I never know. This year I've got a plan, but usually I don't, right? I, I decide what I'm doing on October 28th, you know? I'm like, oh, shit, that knows in a couple of days. I better make a decision. <laughs> well, it, I mean, the, the thing is, like, um, I, I'm pretty particular. Like, I, I actually use my plotting as my outline as a kind of a filter. If, if I can't come up with a storyline that hits all nine points it's not ready to go so That's i don't good. even bother with things that haven't hit all of those points so when i say i have um 10 whips ready to go i'm talking about whips that are actually planned out have an outline et cetera. Et cetera. so but that, that's about how many i have is actually it might be 15 now but um i'm, I'm kind of thinking i should do um just one of my fun ones. Uh, I have one called The Queen's Descent, 
which is about a woman who has a telepathic connection with a computer that runs the city and the city has been taken over and the computer was destroyed except it wasn't because it had a backup right cool Uh (laughs) uh-oh so it's this kind of weird mech love story kind of thing but you know that's awesome I need to have more stuff stuff where love transcends just being able to grind genitals with each other. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah, this is true. This is very true. I agree with you. Yeah. Especially because all this is changing. You know what? There's a, if you're writing a short story in that, there's an anthology that Kat Rambo is organizing. Uh, She just won uh, Nebula this year. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, 5,000 word maximum. That's all about that. The way that technology is changing relationships. So there you Mm. go. The the thing is, I wasn't, I'm not sure if it's going to be short story, novella or novel length yet. Kind of. Yeah. There's going to be a good amount of world development on that one. So. Yeah, so when Siobhan asked a question, I don't know how to plug our Game of Tones houses, so I'm demonstrating. <laughs> yes, um, I don't know, have you seen any of the thing we've been talking about, of the, this Game of Tones thing that we're doing? Yes, um, I'm not sure that I would be able to have the, the time devotion yep. to be able to participate although i am kind of considering going mercenary that's cool that's cool you can change from stream to stream or even sprint to sprint it's totally fine yeah so yeah i might just do that uh cairo there (laughs) siobhan (laughs) yeah yeah okay so she's going through the houses obviously uh siobhan is leading house character so this is you know, she's pretty excited about uh, the game of tones. I am too, because I think this is going to be fun. I don't know if this is going to end up being a good or a bad decision. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to spend so much time organizing that, that I'm not going to get any writing done. That one I had to spell out. <laughs> yeah, she keeps trying to shorten it, but yeah sorry anyway yeah right these are all the different houses that we made up and she's running through that so if if you're not participating in game of tones don't worry about that and if you are or if you haven't heard of it guys it's a kind of a game within nanorimo that we are doing uh basically if, if you've ever done the nano house cup it's going to work a bit like that only it's going to run all month and there are eliminations right you pick the house you want to represent these are the descriptions of the different houses. Um, there are also rules for creating a uh, lesser house and swearing fealty if you want to do that, but I don't want to get into that right now. But the basic rules are you pick a house, you represent that house. Um, you can you can do it like as a mercenary. You can flip, like I said, from stream to stream or sprint to sprint, represent different people if you want, or you can declare your undying loyalty to your house until it's defeated. At the end of every five days, one of those six houses is eliminated, whichever one has the lowest word count overall. Then the members of that house go into a draft. One third of them become part of the undead horde, right? And now if you're part of the undead horde, you have to represent the undead horde for the rest of the game, right? Otherwise, you get to pick another house that you're going to go bend the knee to. And then, you know, or, you know, maybe you decide you're going to go mercenary from that point, whatever, right? Um, You keep track of your uh, word counts by doing sprints in participating streamers' uh, uh, streams. There will be channel point rewards. Um, On my screen there, uh, you'll see that at the bottom of the chat, there is a treasure chest. That's my uh, channel points. I call them booty coins because we're Sable's privateers. Right. Um, You click that there will be um, each of the active houses will have their symbol up and it says house whatever, you know, house Lapin. Right. Redeem word count. And then it'll you select that it'll cost you one channel point because we have to make it cost something. And then in the text box that comes up, you type in your word count. If you're representing a minor house as well, you type in. The minor house's name as well, like Bob's house, Sauropoda. You would say, you know, I don't know, 301 Sauropoda. 
If you're in Bob's stream, he will have his own channel point reward that he will be keeping track of for his minor house. And then we tally it by the records that are kept of this for the rest of the of the game, right? So, and that's the deal. And it's going to be fun. At the very last, on the 30th, um, it's going to be one house versus the undead horde. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> And I may be insane, but it's going to be fun. Oh, thank you very much for the follow. Uh, Honeypot mag Magnet. I think it was meant to be Magnet, but they spell, but, you know, the, probably the spelling was taken, right? So, well, welcome either way. And I hope I got that right. And thank you for the follow. Okay. I think it's the time for the break now. So... <laughs> I'm I'm going, I have to pee. <laughs> so <laughs> Do the pee pee dance. That's right, do the pee pee dance. So we're gonna go do that. We'll be back in about approximately ten minutes. All right.
we're back. How's the music level, guys? Is it too loud? Ah, outline styles via Nanoremo. That's cool. I think you're still on mute. Oh, well, there you are. Yes, I, I was muted, so you didn't hear me hacking and yelling at the children and, <laughs> and taking, taking drugs. <coughs> yeah, no doubt. I'm sorry about all the coughing, by the way. I've been fighting off a cold for a couple of days, so... I'm, I'm better than I was yesterday, but yeah. Sorry, but... My whole family is sick, and so I totally feel your pain. Yeah. We just kind of walk around like zombies, coughing zombies. Uh. That's what I did yesterday. I was like, eh. I sat in front of my computer. I think I got three things done. I was there all day. My brain just wasn't... <laughs> You know, you know what? When you feel like crap, anything you get done is is just something you've got done. So agreed. Take the win. Agreed. Okay, so my system is set up in such a way that you're going to be a disembodied voice when we're doing the sprinting. I hope that's okay. <laughs> yeah. So I'm uh, working on doing what you were talking about. As a matter of fact, that's what I'm doing. I'm uh, taking the mushy stuff and I'm putting an exoskeleton on it to make my first draft of the first novel work so that it's ready for me to reference and I know where I am when I finish, at least that's my plan, the third novel for this nano. <laughs> right? I got to do this with the first novel and the second novel, but actually I think the first novel has more structural problems than the second novel does. So I'm, I'm getting a little worried about the time press, but... I think it will be enough that I should be able to manage it. That's my plan. You know, the the thing is, we our, our job is literally getting things done when we get them done. So, you know, the, the self-imposed deadlines notwithstanding, we at least have the time to get it done. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that way too. Ooh, ghosts. <laughs> I wonder what that... I, I like the food fight that was started in the chat while we're gone. That was cool. Alright. Um, yeah. Well, if you guys are ready, let's get started here. I am going to have to reconfigure my thingy. There we go. <laughs> Look at it, you're huge! Okay. There we go. And 15 minutes on the clock, and then a five-minute break. But I may be longer. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I may have to go off the screen and use the cell phone for breaks, because otherwise we're not going to see Sarah, and that would not be fun. So, all right. And feel free to murmur to yourself and stuff. Some people like that. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, we haven't done a write-in together yet, so I don't really know what your process is while you're working. Uh, well, when I'm writing, I don't usually talk to myself, but um, right now I'm just going to be working on my editing job, so you may hear me cussing out. No worries. <laughs> that is not an Oxford comma. I don't care how many, many times you call it that. It's not an Oxford comma. My problem is I can't remember my own damn date system. But that's why I have this article on World Anvil, so I don't have to remember. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Corn Moon, okay. No, I think I want to make it later.
Dingy thing. Aha! Kahuna is raiding. Welcome, Kahuna. Thank you for the raid. We are doing a writing sprint at the moment, or, well, Sarah and I are both doing an editing sprint, I think. Um, yep. <laughs> three and a half minutes left on the clock, approximately. So, glad to see you. I'm pretty sure I repeated that because this was a taken from another thing which I made a short story of. Clearly that was not where I repeated it. Where was that? That's right, I did repeat that. Where was I? All right. And that's the end of the first sprint. I will go back to that screen. Did that work? Yes, it did. Good for me. I figured out a way around it. All right. So I don't know how you did. I managed to get, uh, I think, a scene and a half edited myself. How did everybody else do who was participating? Eight and a half pages. Awesome. That's awesome. Moonflower says, I didn't even realize that I had gotten a Twitch error like an hour or so ago, <laughs> but I'm back now. <laughs> they were putting it on and lurking, were you? <laughs> the screen was frozen or something. Yeah, I Twitch has been twitchy lately. Daz did some research. That's cool. 
I see Makaro dealt with his rats, who were licking his face and his ears. <laughs> yeah, so I've got a... <clears throat> About 30 seconds before we get back to work, the break timer thing will make a dragon roar noise. I see the fam dodging in and out there. It's great. <laughs> They're gone now. They disappeared. <laughs> Oh, Makaro also did an editing sprint on his Alliance article. That's cool. Right on. How, how'd you make it through? Did you get it edited? Are you still working on it? Moonflower says, I was just working away on an article and I had a second source of noise from my sister's music, so I didn't realize that this wasn't playing anymore. Fair enough. Makara says he's almost done. That's cool. I see what you mean about you stopped talking and then life starts happening around you, eh? It's funny. It's cool. Yep. Well, and the boy child is making supper. Awesome. And I'm assuming the girl child is being assigned tasks. Yes. Right on. Yeah. So. Things are getting done. Hopefully. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, she's like, yeah, but I'm the mom. I'm going to have to check as soon as I get off this thing. Yeah. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I hear you. You know what I should have done was get coffee. <laughs> I have hot water with lemon and honey and cinnamon. Awesome. Yeah, I think maybe I'll run out at the next break and get coffee when that happens. I could probably do it in five minutes if that's all I'm doing, I think. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Yeah, uh, interesting thing. Um, Coffee shops are not like a huge thing in this area. Oh, interesting. Especially like, well, okay, drive through coffee shops. I think the closest one is like a five minute drive. So, yeah. It's not fun. It's like, dudes, just attach a hose. What, what, what I need is a three tap kitchen one for water, one for, one for hot water, one for cold water, and one for coffee. There you go. And just run the coffee 24-7. Yeah. Yes. I'm sure I'm not the only person who feels this way. So no. <laughs> Not at all. No, I have a very... We just, we just need to, to establish that infrastructure. Yes. Yes, this is required. Yeah, I have a very unhealthy relationship with coffee myself, so... All right. Here's my dragon roar, and I was wrong, it's 15 seconds. So, all right, I'll flip my screen back. And we shall get back to work.
Thank <laughs> you.
I just had a sudden sense that I should look at the chat. And I have a bot to get rid of! Yay! Die, bot! See you later, Moonflower. I see you're out. Dinner time, and uh, congratulations for finishing your article, Makaro. 21, or, uh, 2,061 words. That's well within the limit. Good for you. And you're getting a charging cable, so maybe you're not hearing me right now, but good job. All right. I'm going to get back on my thing here. I feel I'm on a bit of a roll. I really like this scene. All right, and that's the second sprint. Okay. I'll answer that one when I get back, Bob. I gotta run and get coffee while this break. I um, am mostly finished the scene I was working on. How did everyone else do?
you know, I'm a big fan of the uh, the um, El Dorado GIF. Both, both is good. has coffee. It only took me two minutes. All right. So what have I missed? Nachos. Nachos? Nachos are good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Dinosaur Bob says, before I forget, got my, sub my submission confirmation from Podcastle. It said they're running about 16 days to response, so three weeks. Yeah, somewhere, two to three weeks. Good luck. Awesome. Uh, Bob wrote an amazing story about a necromancer that I thought was just great, and I suggested that he submit it to some pro markets. So we're trying Podcastle first. <coughs> Excuse me. Daz is uh, conflicted about... Yeah, whether to write it or just play it. <laughs> Makaro asks, am I dead set on writing more myself right now? Not necessarily. Do you have an article you'd like us to have a look at? You want us to take a look at what you just finished? We could do that. I'm sure Sarah would be fine with offering her opinion and whatnot too. In that case, let me go to the main screen here. Actually, to be honest, it's a good time for a bit of a break. And I don't know, I don't feel like I take a break when I go run and get coffee, so. <laughs> that's not a break, that's refueling. That's right. Writer fuel. All right. We want an edit, there's the link. Let's check it out. You're going to get, be a disembodied voice in the background again, I'm sorry. Okay. Grammar flow primarily. Okay. Exploration Alliance. It only looks like this, by the way, because I've got like a half screen going on here. <coughs> Maybe since Sarah is a disembodied voice anyway, I should just go to the main screen. I will do that and then I can do this and we can see the whole thing. Okay. By the way, I love the theme and display on your world. Really beautiful. Patience is bitter, but her fruit is sweet. Out of a side door came a woman in a gray cloak. Her upper face was covered with a double black ball mask. Black ball mask? Okay. Its upper half made from stiffened linen, the lower half thick black cotton bordered with cheap lace. Okay. That's, I don't, yeah, I'm, I don't know what a ball, are you, are you talking about, like, because when I hear ball mask, I think of kink community, so I don't know if that's what you intended. Um, oh, oh, I see, you're talking about masquerade mask kind of deal. Okay, all right. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, aside, uh, you want to delete that S. Aside from the lace. Oh, and if you see anything as I go, Sarah, throw it in, right? Only a small diamond shape on the cotton decorated the mask. Her right eye shone bright green, which some would recognize as a, cheap, as a typical cheap contact, worn by those on a budget trying to resemble the upper class. Interesting. So the upper class has like green eyes. Okay. Her left eye she kept closed as she walked through the alleyways at a brisk pace. That's interesting. Um, I don't know if you saw Dimitri's stream on talking about having one eye, but it is difficult to keep track of depth perception. And if you're not used to it, it's really difficult. And if you're, um, moving around in the dark, like, I don't know, like, like this could like it's alleyways, right? I would think it would be even more difficult. Um, you might, I, I don't know. Is this something she does routinely or does she have a, uh, like a, 
a cover over her eye or something because I would think that keeping it closed that long would be damn near impossible myself. I'll go on while I'm waiting for the leg to catch up. Her path took her through a labyrinth of inner streets, yet she walked as someone who knew exactly where she was going. Then, okay, so she does actually move through this frequently. I still question it. She's got to be like a super assassin to do that. But if she's a super assassin, fine. Okay. Then just as sudden, and that you need suddenly there, right? Um, because of the tense, yeah. Okay, then just as suddenly as she had appeared in the back streets, she disappeared into an alcove, entering a door that was impossible to spot unless one stood straight in front of it. As soon as she entered the building, she closed her right eye and opened her left. Ah, that's what she's doing. Okay. Allowing her to instantly adjust to the bright lights. A red-eyed butler greeted her, wearing a similar double mask, his entirely silver with two crossed daggers as its sole. His entirely silver. I would put a comma there. That way I know to, uh, to pause, because otherwise, like, I, I was reading on, like, ex expecting something else. So, yeah his entirely silver his entirely silver comma with two cross daggers as its sole decoration she nodded to him daggers are cheap but a good knife and you misspelled <laughs> knife you you put a v in there and you mean an f is priceless he smiled and responded a cloak is more valuable when dyed properly code words fair enough you need to divide this up she nodded to him Daggers are cheap, but a good knife is priceless. This is a new sentence, he, or a new paragraph. He smiled and responded, a cloak is more valuable when dyed properly. When you're changing speakers, you need to change the paragraph. Right? So. Uh, her open eye narrowed, an instinctive gesture she quickly disguised by turning it into a blink. His response should have been an acknowledging of her identity, not the announcing of an unexpected visitor. She nodded slowly before replying. The smartest will coordinate with the sky. Looking carefully at the butler's eyes, she saw them widen in surprise before recovering. His subsequent nod was all she needed to confirm the visitor's identity. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm confused there, right? Um, did you mean to say that? Like, she doesn't need to confirm the visitor's identity. She's the visitor, right? Um, his subsequent nod conf uh, told her that at last she realized who she was. Something like that. Right. Okay. The past seven seasons, she had attended 15 of these Alliance meetings. In those, she had met with three different alchemists and four different Grey Cloaks. For someone else to appear now, Without any advanced warning. Oh, okay, I understand now. Okay, that's confusing. Um, and I understand that it's it has to be confusing to some degree because it's a code. But maybe here, back here with uh, her open eye narrowed, an instinctive gesture she quickly disguised by turning it into a blink. His response should have been an acknowledging of her identity, not the announcing of an unexpected visitor. An unexpected visitor. Who was here then? Question mark. Right? She nodded slowly, and then maybe that can even be a new paragraph. She nodded slowly before replying, the smartest will coordinate with the sky. Um, and then, you know, continuing from there. Right? But no, I actually, that doesn't make sense either because I don't know. Okay, I don't understand this. You need to re redo that paragraph because I don't understand what's going on, right? Because this here tells me she's already aware of the visitor. But why then is she surprised that he's acknowledging an unexpected visitor? I'm sure you have your reasons, but they're not being communicated. Okay. Well, uh if I can throw in. Yeah, you certainly can. Um, if you break it up, uh, okay, so she nodded to him, daggers are cheap, but a good knife is priceless. Then make his response the beginning of the next paragraph. 
and her re- response to that, like her reaction to that, then we it'll break it up more into that dialogue of you have the code word, a kind of sort of explanation of the code word, either through context or, you know, a more literal explanation. And then uh, she nodded slowly, should be the beginning of a third paragraph. So that you have like the unexpected visitor, um, you know, maybe even throw in something uh, as she's thinking about who it could possibly be. And then she, you know, the smartest will coordinate with the sky, which is obviously a, a reference to it being a specific person, you know, based on the context following that. So if you right. divide it up into those three distinct parts of the conversation, I think it'll be easier for people to follow. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I agree. Yep. See, this is why Sarah's helpful, right? Yeah, okay. And then Makara explains, he indicates someone unexpected is present, and she probes him to figure out who it is. Okay. Okay, yes, all right. The smartest will coordinate with the sky. Maybe if there was a question mark there. That would help me to know that she's asking a question. Like, well, okay. So even if you put like, okay, the 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 paragraph following that, the past seven seasons, right? It, all but the last sentence. If you put that before she replies, the smartest will coordinate with the sky. You know, she, you you get walked through her think yes. her thought process, yes, as to who it could possibly be. She makes the response and it's confirmed yes okay yep there you go yeah i'll continue from there the past seven seasons she had attended 15 of these alliance meetings in those she had met with three different alchemists yeah exactly sarah's right um and four different gray cloaks for someone else to appear now without any advanced warning the only reasonable explanation would be coin leader of the gray cloaks um minor thing you've got the gray cloaks the gray cloaks it might have a different rhythm to it if you put uh the gray cloak leader but you don't have to that's just a rhythm thing it's not relevant you know it's not important okay as to why coin had come that she needed to find out yeah sarah's right if you divide it up the way she described and put that before this you know question right um, from from that point, uh, you know, would be coin leader of the gray cloaks or gray cloak leader. Hmm. Actually, yeah, exactly like she said, right? And then the smartest will coordinate with the sky, etc. And then after all that, as to why a coin to come, that she needed to find out. Probably in the same paragraph as his subsequent nod was all she needed to confirm the visitor's identity as to why coin had come, that she needed to find out. Yeah, that would make much more sense. Okay, the butler directed her to a meeting room where three people were waiting. From the alchemist, there was a woman with four small alabaster stones woven into her mask and subtle brown contacts in her eyes. <clears throat> From the gray cloaks, she saw a man with brass dye decorating the edge of the linen wearing brass dye brass colored dye or is it made of brass uh, wearing similar subtle contacts the last person was coin wearing a fully gray mask decorated with a single embroidered coin her left eye was deep blue her right eye she kept closed the woman nodded at the three the tide comes in treacherously quick tonight she saw alabaster and brass stiffen for those words were not what they had expected. She should have greeted them with, the dark came far too quick tonight. But Coyne smiled faintly before responding. And again, this is a new paragraph because we have a new speaker. But again, Coyne smiled, er, but Coyne smiled faintly before responding. (coughs) Excuse me. Even dangerous times can be fortuitous. Um, You, that's misspelled. You have an N in there you don't need. It's not fortunate or fortunus. 
It's uh, fortuitous is the word, I believe. Or, for, yeah. Okay. An acknowledgement and a clear declaration of her intent. Okay. There's a lot of subtle context going on here. And unless you're familiar with the code, it's difficult to follow unless we're going to go through their process of thought at the time that something is said, not after. Because I, I think this, again, would work in better in the way that Sarah was describing, right? Maybe? I don't know if you if you agree with me here, Sarah, but, um, you know, the well, woman... Yeah, because, I mean, the, the way this is written thus far, there's enough mystery in who the woman is and what they're even doing that you don't need to add the mystery of what this code is. Oh, you know, hello, there's... kitten. Sorry, Kitten just came back from surgery today. Aww. So I guess she's coming here to lie down, poor baby. Yeah. Well, she uh, had her uh, ovaries dealt with today. So, yes. Poor baby. Yeah, because she's that age and yeah. So. I will not be lifting her up to show you cat tax. So sorry, guys. Anyway, do go on. Yeah. This is just her safe space here. My band is in here, so. <laughs> yeah. You were saying there's enough mystery with this woman. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. That you, in fact, adding the explanation of the code without necessarily explaining why they use a code actually draws you in more. You know, like, ooh, a code. You know, like why why is she being referred to as the tide instead of the dark you know what what do those two things imply about her that she's usually called the dark and tonight she's referred to as the tide i'm assuming the tide and the dark refer to the woman but you know it, it, essentially what those things mean provides the interaction between the characters and a, a little bit of insight into what this group thought process is. Right. <clears throat> okay. The woman nodded, satisfied with Coin's answer. Had Coin provided the normal response, it would have indicated duress or nearby snooping ears. Improvising along meant all was well. Okay. Yeah, as such, it seemed Coin was here because she had heard of the recent positive results and had come to personally get involved at the next phase. Okay. With the exchange of key phrases out of the way, the meeting went into veiled discussing of results and future steps. Had there been anyone eavesdropping, all they would have heard were vague terms <laughs> that sounded like weird business deals and gossip. But those present discussed the big success of the new steamships and all agreed to send one on a trial trip to Gold Rock. After the meeting, each participant went their own way. The woman was second to leave, switching eyes again. Uh, switching, I, I realize it's one eye, but I believe it's switching eyes. Am I right about this, Sarah? Yeah. Okay. Switching eyes again before navigating the maze of inner streets. Entering a completely different building than she had originally come out of, she stepped through a back door into an empty kitchen. She swiftly took off her mask and hid it behind the stove, then took out her contacts and slipped them between the gears of a ticking clock. She turned her cloak inside out, showing a far lighter gray instead. Then she moved upstairs, across the sky bridge, down the stairs, then stepped into a busy dining room. Um, I don't know if you need all that. Um, it, it, she's taking out the contacts and slipping them between the gears of a tick, ticking clock. Are they hard contacts that will then be crushed by those gears? Is that her way of disposing of them? Right. Or is she I, storing I, them? I'm just thinking if she tries to put those back in, that's going to suck. There you go, Makaro. That's much better, I think. Now I understand what's going on. The woman nodded at the three. The tide comes in treacherously quick tonight. She saw alabaster and brass stiffen, for those words were not what they had expected. She should have greeted them with, the dark came far too quick tonight. Instead, 
She indicated Coin's presence was an unexpected danger that could sweep them away. I like that. Thank you very much. That's that's excellent, and it gives me some feel of where the code originates. Readers like puzzles. They like to figure stuff out. If you give them things like that, they'll seize on it. And that's, you know, it'll intrigue them and draw them in, and they'll want to know more. What is this organization? What are they doing? You know? Why are they doing this? Anyway, here, when I was here, I'm saying, you know, she moved upstairs, across the sky bridge, down the stairs, stepped into a busy dining room. Do we need a map? Like, I, I, I don't know that we need all that information. Um, uh, she went upstairs, across the sky bridge, and stepped into a busy dining room. And the only re Oh, no, go ahead. Path that that no one would that, would that would not allow people to know where she came from or, yeah I, the the details are less important than the intent in that i think right i think it just slows it down is my point it feels like over detail and it's something that i used to do a lot in my writing was you know open the door, close the door, left, you know. If the person stops talking and say they're going to leave, you don't have to describe them leaving if you continue with the conversation like they're not there, right? You know, stuff like that. It's, uh, yeah, it's just, you, you, don't, you don't need all that, right? Okay. There she ignored all present and sat down at the bar. The bartender nodded at her. Greetings, Miss Latimer. The usual? She nodded in response. I would make that a new paragraph. Actually, I would make them both a new paragraph. I would start a new paragraph with the bartender nodded at her. Greetings, Miss Latimer, the usual. <coughs> then another new paragraph. She nodded in response, and the bartender promptly poured her a stout ale. Taking the occasional sip, she observed the crowd while idly chatting with the bartender. Her work tonight had only just begun. Cool. Um, yeah, the only reason why I was going into details, you said mostly grammar stuff. Okay, then that's the kind of edit you want there. Am I looking at the rest of the article or was it just the fiction bit that you wanted to start with? Oh, you lost internet for a second. That's crappy. I hope you haven't missed anything important. Um, we were uh, describing how you probably don't need quite this many details here and she moved upstairs across the sky bridge, down the stairs, then stepped into a busy dining room. Um, it, it sounds like you're describing a, a map and we don't need that much information. I get that, you know, like Sarah pointed out, she's obviously um, trying to hide where she came from. So um, then perhaps then she went upstairs across the sky bridge and stepped into a busy dining room or the busy dining room. Right. That could be. Yeah. Or even like, you know, she followed a pre-planned convoluted path to hide her her destination or origin or whatever um you know just letting people know what her intent is in taking such a pathway or you know maybe it's that if she's crossing from one type of area in the city to another type of area it's hard to do that because of class differences you know explaining the reasoning behind her path is more important than what her actual path is right yeah agreed <clears throat> makaro says after crossing a sky bridge to the adjacent building she stepped into a busy dining room question yeah i like that um i especially like that because i wasn't entirely sure she was moving to a different building i've been in fancy uh places where there are sky bridges that go across an atrium right? So I wasn't entirely sure. And that's what I initially visualized. So cool. Yes, that's, that's excellent. Now, um, am I reading the rest of the article? Or were you just concerned with the fictional lead in? I like it. Um, overall, my impression is I'm intrigued. I want to know who these people are, why they speak in code, what the big uh, conspiracy they're engaged in is and what the consequences are going to be if they fuck up, right? So, which is exactly what you want, I'm sure.
sorry, waiting for a reply on whether or not I am looking at the rest of the article. That's all questions in the article? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I, I know. I'm sure they are in the article. It's just I was uh, I was commenting on the fiction in particular that if your goal is to draw us in and, and intrigue us, it worked. I'd say. Sarah, your opinion? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, the, the you know essentially we're we're nitpicking a, a little bit of the flow to maximize that, but it was it was definitely a draw. Which is your editor's job, by the way. Right? Your editor's job is to do that. Nick, pick your flow, you know, uh, file off the edges and cut your diamond and make it pretty. So. Mm -hmm. um, to, to go back in the chat a little bit. Okay. Um, how would you phrase that brass lines, the edge of the mask? Um, I, right. would use, I would use something along the lines of edged in brass filigree. That yeah is a little more um, clear about what exactly is going on there. Um, the other option would be, you know, like, uh, I, I know uh, some people in this kind of time period used like thread of gold and thread of brass. Mm -hmm. no. Did they use thread of brass? I know they, thread of gold and thread of copper. So maybe a thread of brass, if it's more of a thread that is like a colored yeah. brass or... I think um, I'd have to look that up myself. I'm not sure. I think brass is considerably yeah. harder, so I'm not sure it would work as a thread. Yeah. So, but like... Um, but a wire? Like actually wire that's, you know, formed into decoration, it would be like a, a filigree. Yeah. Right or or a thin frame of uh, brass decorating the edge of the linen. If you don't want filigree, maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I I think the comment about fortunus as opposed to fortuitous is more about your audience's understanding right. than necessarily the accuracy of the word. Um. Obviously, they're, they could be using something that is a little more obscure to modern audiences intentionally. Fortunus, Middle English Compendium, right? So, yeah. fair enough, but it's not, uh, I don't think it's a modern word. Yeah, I mean, if they have the if they have the technology for contacts, Middle English probably isn't still in use. But assuming a similar history history timeline to our own. But on the other hand, if you are deliberately including it to in introduce that feeling of being slightly archaic and out of time, right, kind of uh, mm -hmm. anachronistic, then fair enough. Yeah, like. Maybe maybe they use specifically archaic words to indicate uh, levels of importance. Okay, now how much more of this do we have? Because I am running out of time in the stream here. <clears throat> okay, this doesn't look like it'll take that long, so we'll finish it. Um, from the sidebar, there's their symbol, because I know that that's where the symbol goes, which makes sense, a compass rose. Um, explore freely is their motto. Founding date, 327, um, in your world's calendar, obviously. Main base, Green Bay, a former city abandoned after disaster, okay. Uh, leader, Isabel Patience Latimer, heir of the Latimer family, covert leader of the industrialists. Oh, so she's like part of two groups, interesting. Um, oh, yeah, maybe the industrialists are part of this alliance, right? Obviously, because this was the alliance challenge was an organization of organizations. Aha, uh -huh, and you do explain it here. Fair enough. Alternative name, the expedition. Military level. Oh, they have uh, soldiers. Okay. Training, semi-professional and veterancy experienced. Cool. 
members, industrialists, gray cloaks, and alchemist union. I don't know what a gray cloak is. Okay, an espionage network selling information and courier services with long-term profit prevailing over quick wins. Cool. I like forward-thinking roguish types. That's excellent. Um, industrialists and alchemists I can figure out. Opponents, conventionalists and the gray church. Conventionalists, obsessed with lifting themselves up and keeping others down. The conventionalists hold back Greyburn's development. Yeah, they're, uh, as, uh, was it David Weber who said that? Or Eric Flint? I don't remember one of them, but then they said their entire political policy platform is gimme. Right? Those guys. Okay. Charity is the only purpose of the great church, yet many fear the influence they could wield. Ah, okay. Important individuals, Isabel Patience Lat Latimer, Emmett Pleasant Latimer, a relative. Okay. Um, Agnes Amaryllis Gridley. Bases, Green Bay, and Lonely Isle. Okay. Yeah, current leader of the Grey Cloaks. Okay. And I'll break these down once we've gone into the rest of the article. Together we shall rise. Defying the confinements from a judgmental elite, the Exploration Alliance covertly aims to advance society. A fragile team-up of three secret organizations, the Alliance works on technological advancements with which they hope to develop society and free it from the grasp of the arrogant upper class. One of their main goals is to send improvised steamships on expeditions outside the Greyburn area. Each member organization has its own motives. The industrialists aim to be freed from the scorn of their peers. The alchemist union seeks a safe place where they can practice and research magic more freely. And the gray cloaks primarily seek profits. Yet all are united by the or unified, sorry, by their main goal of ending the stagnation of Greyburn society, <laughs> for which the full blame lies with the conventionalists and their obsession with public image. Structure. Like its member organizations, the Alliance takes precautions so that exposed members cannot topple the entire organization, starting with a clustered setup. In each city and town where they operate, only a few individuals of each organization are familiar with the other Alliance members and will only occasionally meet to exchange resources and information. Low-ranked individuals may only vaguely be aware of the other organizations. The exception to this are the two Alliance bases, Green Bay and the Lonely Isle. They're all work together, though the higher-ups remain masked. That makes sense. Um, I'm still not quite getting... Okay, good. Culture, you're explaining it there. Okay, good. Uh, secrecy remains a must in the Alliance, making disguising oneself very important to all members. Members who wear near-identical masks and clothing, with only colors and small marks to differentiate between each other. The masks are a combination of stiffened linen for the top linen for the top part and cotton for the bottom part. Contact lenses help hide one's true eye color. Meetings will follow strict procedures with key phrases and special signals to verify membership. Voice changers are often used to disguise one's voice, again meant to help prevent identifying an attendee. If anyone were ever to be caught, these measures should buy others the time needed to get to safety. I st okay, that I'm a bit no uncertain of what the consequences are if safety is violated if they're caught right like why they're they're covert they're trying to open up society i get that the conventionalists are their opposition and i get why what i don't understand is what happens to them if they screw it up is their membership illegal are there going to be like legal charges are they going to be executed um, you know, are thugs hired by the conventionalists in illegal uh, secret practices going to come and burn down their family's house? Like, what happens? Right? Okay. Um, while careful in their interactions, the members will all treat each other with respect. Each group has aspects that the other groups admire, all serving society as well as their own survival. Disagreements are debated fairly, and even when outvoted, no rancor will remain. That's pretty generous, especially when one of the groups is interested in profit. So, um... I, it's one of those things, they tell you not to use weasel words in non-fiction writing either, 
but this might be one of those cases where it would be helpful. I assume it's not universal that there's never any rancor. Maybe it's usually, right? Your or thoughts, sir? The, the idea that no rancor occurs as a group-wide function, although individuals may experience right. bitterness. Right, right. Okay. Okay, sorry, just uh, skimming back in the in the chat to make sure I haven't missed anything important. The weird part is my mind went for fortunus, so it's completely ac accidental. I forgot fortunus exists. That's cool. Uh, DM Stretch says that brass is easy to do as a board or use the groove type. For CSS, that is. Oh, okay. We're talking about the format. Um, yeah, it's not as much about safety, more about exposure. Need to work on rephrasing that a bit. Okay, but then in that case, this seems like some really extensive precautions to take for not being exposed, right? Like, if you're a Democrat in the middle of a community of Republicans, if somebody finds out, you know, you're, you're not about to theoretically get your house burnt down, right? So, it, you know, it's not like a Democrat might not blog about Democrat policies in the middle of a Republican community, right? I, it's, it seems a little extreme. I just, I, I, people don't do this kind of stuff without damn good motivation. And that damn good motivation will either be everything's going to be screwed up if they don't do it, in which case, why are the other uh, individual members, like not the leaders, the leaders could be zealots who are driven to fix things, right? But, um, th but like the, the rank and file, you know, probably aren't as committed. And if they're not, then they're going to need motivation for doing all this stuff. Ah, okay. Makaro says, I'll add to culture or above it that basically exposure means you may very well lose all investments, authorizations. I see. So there are societal privileges that you will not have, right? You will be restricted in your movements, in your money, right? A gray cloak or an alchemist would get cut off from income while an industrialist would, an industrialist would get disinherited. Okay, that's great. Yes, you need to put in there, yeah, and probably culture is the place to do it, that there are significant social consequences and exactly what those are, right? Because and Social and financial consequences. Because that's a damn good reason to do all this. Yeah, okay. Cool. <clears throat> <clears throat> and like Daz Dazzlecat said, right, um, why no rancor? There needs to be a reason why rancor is not expressed or acted upon. Yeah, I, I agree, right? Because people are, com I don't know, if you've ever been part of a nonprofit group, <laughs> especially if you've been on any of the leadership of a nonprofit group, you know that <clears throat> no matter what you do, you cannot make everybody happy. And there is going to be somebody who is just going to be you know, you, you think it's such a minor thing and they are ridiculous about their insistence. You know, they'll attack you, they'll attack the organization, you know. So if that doesn't happen, we need a reason why. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's over things like, I didn't like the logo, right? People can be like that. So, okay, main agenda. The Exploration Alliance seeks to further technological development, surpassing the societal restrictions that are holding back the Industrial Revolution. They seek a grand expedition, both as a goal and as a means. By contacting other civilizations, discovering new resources, ah, and finding better lands outside the reach of the conventionalists, they aim to rid themselves of the oppression of societal expectations. Now, what Sarah doesn't know, and I do, is that this is a co-created world called Synergosia. And basically, uh, there was a map laid out with a bunch of different regions, and people signed up to be um, to create their society within those regions but they they span across eras as well as locations so there are magical barriers preventing people from moving easily between these 
regions, right? So this is actually a huge thing, what they're looking for. They want to expand beyond their region, and it may require magical power as well as the desire to do it. So <clears throat> that's cool. Okay, history. Isabel Patience Latimer is living proof that sometimes a name is a perfect fit. As she grew up, there, she realized... There should be a comma before sometimes as well. Before sometimes? Oh yeah, that yeah. comma sometimes, yeah? Okay. As she grew up, she realized society was stagnating and that saying so would only get in her way. Instead, she kept her eyes and ears open, patiently plotting for future days. Her younger brother, Emmett Pleasant Latimer, was more vocal about his discontent. And he seems to be oppositely made. If, he, if he's complaining, <clears throat> Pleasant doesn't quite fit, does it? Okay, Isabel convinced him to be more careful so high society would only frown at him rather than spit him out. At age 16, Isabel received man management rights over her first factory. She managed it well. Okay, wait a minute, I thought we were on the verge of the Industrial Revolution, but now we have factories. Are, are you saying the next stage that's holding back the next stage in the Industrial Revolution? Because if we have factories, we're in it. Okay. Um, Makara says, my neighbor regions are gothic horror. Boy, am I glad the expedition has military forces. Yeah, fair enough. Gothic horror around you. Oh, right. Right, because it's all that Victorian era. Um... Yeah. So. <clears throat> yeah, okay, so, yeah, are we in the Industrial Revolution or on the verge of it? Um, if you're saying hold back the next stage of the Industrial Revolution, that would make more sense. But if we have a factory, we're in the Industrial Revolution. Okay. Uh, she managed it well, all the while looking for loopholes to exploit in the future. Two years later, Emmett received a factory in the far south. After a few years, the two started funneling resources into covert projects, concurrently recruiting like-minded individuals for a clustered organization. Later, the organization would be called the Industrialists. While their actions remained unnoticed by high society, the Grey Cloaks did not miss what they were doing. No, because good rogues will not. At age 22, Isabel was contacted by Agnes Amaryllis Gridley, the leader of the Grey Cloaks. Agnes offered services and aid, in, and, and, you need an and, in return, she sought resources and uh, getting some members hired in useful positions. That's an awkward phrase. Um, and employment for members in some useful position, or for some members in useful positions, maybe. Right. After a few years of careful cooperation, Agnes brought Isabel in contact with several members of the Alchemist Union. Um, after months of negotiations, the three organizations formed the Exploration Alliance. In the years since then, the Alliance managed to reclaim parts of the Lost City of Green Bay, as well as build a base on the Lonely Isle. In the far south, deep within, deep within the jungle of Deepwood Fortress, they set weaponry and other new technology. Or they test weaponry and other new technology. <clears throat> okay, I, I would I would uh, question exactly how far the alchemists can go with their magic, because in terms of a secret society that includes magic users and trying to keep secret, that seems like a very nice combination for an oath binding. There you go. And that would explain why they don't have a lot of rank, or they've simply by being a part of this organization, they they fall under this kind of, I guess, a, a, a spell of sorts that prevents them from actively working against each other in any way for any reason, kind of thing. Right. You know the details. Details are negotiable, but <clears throat> yeah, he says fair point. Should explain their magic is limited. That's in the natural law article that he did about this, but not in this article. Yeah, fair enough. Mm -hmm. uh, does Lacat suggest the workshops instead of factories might be uh, more appropriate if we're not in the Industrial Revolution yet? But Makaro explained the Industrial Revolution stagnated. It stopped midway and hasn't advanced much in over half a century. 
okay, fair enough. And I'm getting some, some of these accidents which happened here are why. I'm beginning to lose my voice and we're over time, so I hope that you don't mind if I skip over the details of the territories, but basically a city was destroyed by pollution and now they're reclaiming it. The industrialists are probably cleaning it up. Um, and the Lonely Isle has been untouched and undeveloped, but now they're developing it. Which makes sense if they have, if they've been secretly working on technology that is kind of outlawed, that nobody else has, I can see them developing places nobody else has developed. Makes perfect sense. You should see people blasting shelves into rocks in my town right now to build houses. You know, like, I don't think we had the, it was probably the finances that were holding it back, but you now it's, I guess land is worth it now, so they're working on it. Yeah. Okay. Military. Greyburn knows no military force aside from guards, folk, and hunters due to having no history of warfare. That's interesting. Even the base, the Alliance bases hold no armies. The sole exception to this rule is the private Latimer force in Deepwood Forest, where hostile wildlife has proven the perfect excuse for testing out weaponry and troop organization. How can you have had a civilization with no war? I don't know how that's possible. If you can explain that to me, I want to apply it to politics. Like, that's... Well, I mean, if you, if you formalize all argument negotiation... Mm-hmm, okay. Rules, ...then, you know, it's, it's entirely possible that rather than it expanding to the level of war, you, you essentially, you know, you still have, like, bar fights and, and duels and... and scuffles and things like that but an outright war could be avoided <clears throat> right okay and then my question is why would they create warfare if there never has been warfare right that's ah new follower otter queen of the stone age welcome we're just finishing up the stream actually i don't know if you've been lurking this whole time or not but we're kind of doing an edit here so um yeah i i just why would it even occur to them to make a bunch of dedicated troops if there's no warfare and dedicated troops also how do they get enough experience as an army to be semi-professional and veterancy experienced if there is no history of warfare now, you can argue that fighting against dangerous creatures and hostile wildlife is training, but not as an army. An army w works with disciplined group tactics. Those group tactics are developed to deal with the other group tactics that different opposing groups develop, right? A shield wall isn't going to be that effective against a random, you know, giant lion on a rampage, right? So... Uh, yeah, I, I I think you need to flesh that out a bit, Bob. That's all. I, I don't know. Yeah. Very aggressive for rainforest wildlife. Good point. Should knock it down a level. Yeah. They, they might be semi-trained, you know, ish. Right? But they're, you know, veterancy experienced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I knocked that on level two. Okay. Uh... Also, if they have no history of warfare, remember that they know nothing about tactics. And they have no way of knowing anything about tactics. Because if there's no history of warfare, they have nothing they can study that teaches them things about how tactics work. Trust me, I know this because I knew nothing about tactics and strategy when I started researching for the novel series I'm currently <laughs> working on. And, y you know, it, this, this is how it works. If you don't have a situation come up where something you've tried doesn't work, then you can't develop something new. And you can either learn from your mistakes or you can learn from the mistakes of great commanders of the past or terrible commanders of the past, right? One of the problems with World War I was that warfare for hundreds of years had been people marching in solid forces and shooting at each other with occasional cavalry coming around to break things up 
and then moving out so as to not be destroyed. Hi, kitty. Hi, baby. Would you like to come in my lap, honey? Yeah? Yeah? Sorry. My kitty's, like, trying to climb up on my desk here, so. Oh, hi, honey. Yeah, this is my poor injured baby. All right, you're going to go look out the window. Fine. Okay, so, um, and the problem is with World War One is obviously that didn't work, right? Because people had new and better technology that was just lethal. If you threw um, armies like that at each other, they were just going to get mowed down by machine guns and other various brand new technologies. So that's where the trench system was invented in order to protect these troops from that stuff. But if, um, but, um, I mean, they... The generals of the time period have a reputation for being stupid and lazy, and they were neither. They just had never been confronted with this kind of warfare before, so they had no idea how to react to it. If you're creating a military force, and then you're going to have another military force, and there's no history of warfare here, right? The first time they face something that actually is warfare, the casualties are going to be catastrophic, right? So, you know, and that's fine if that's the story you're building. Just keep that in mind, okay? Ooh, that was close. Well, and I mean, the thing is, if you're basing any kind of military strategy off of hunting, then you need to look at the way the United States attacked the British. Yeah. But would those tactics work, right? I mean, who are they going to attack, first of all? There's no history of warfare. There's no other military, right? Yeah. If, there, if there's... Well, yeah, but, I mean... But, but that's the thing, like, who are they planning on, who are they building this military to fight against? Why is it a concept that they would have to fight against this person? Right. With these people. Um, I mean, and, I assume the conventionalists, but if the conventionalists don't have an army, and they do, why didn't they just walk in and take over already? Why all the secrecy? Hi, we're here, mm -hmm. and we're running the government now, and you're you're all going to be marched off to uh, guillotines and, you know, whatever, right? Because I have guns, and you don't. So, I mean, you I know. Mean, I, I can see them building a military in order to counter the police forces. Yeah, that makes sense. But that's okay. about it. I mean, really... <clears throat> Okay, anyway, I think we've, you know, gone into that enough, right? I'm sure Bob gets the idea. Okay. What are you trying to do, Missy? You're going to hurt yourself. Stop that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, oh, okay, wait wait a second. Did, did Mikaro say, um, is that saying that, the reason why they're building military is because they don't trust any new encounters to be as friendly? Yeah, I'm not sure. I see here they now um, have guards folk. Okay. So they're created well, to... I mean, you know, that, that kind of counters the basic human bias, which is that we kind of expect everybody to be more or less like us. So if they don't have war, then why would they expect other groups to have war like they might not expect them to be as friendly but war is quite a dump yeah that's a good point too oh poor kitty are you having trouble getting comfy baby you would like mom's attention but okay <laughs> all right um okay 3,600 dedicated troops. This puts it at a size nearly outclassing the local guards folk, which would concern many if they cared. Okay. The force is divided into 10 years of troops, each further split into seasons and weeks. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's logical. Yet the smallest unit configuration contains nine days, as single troops are called. Half the years are located at Deepwood Forest. I would suggest capitalizing that year as well as these this year's. That way we know for sure that we're talking about the same group. Okay. Uh, half the years are located at Deepwood Fortress. The rest uh, man, not man's, bases near villages deep in the rainforest. 
Primary arms are air guns and swords, while backup weapons include crossbows, longbows, and survival specialist weapons, while only some per week are trained in, including, or which only some per week are trained in, including pikes and air rifles. Both the fortress and smaller bases are armed with air cannons. And there's our diplomacy web, which is awesome. Silly bum. She's so restless. Okay, we'll go back over your diplomatic relationships here. Oh crap, some words got lost there. Okay. Fair enough. Um, okay, member relationships. Uh, industrialists and gray cloaks. Friendly cooperation. The industrialists know that they can easily deny most claims that the Grey Cloaks could make against them, which makes them more confident. The Grey Cloaks distrust the upper class, but mostly trust any industrialists they've worked with in the past. Knowing the industrialists treat them with respect rather than with contempt, and are a good source of profit, uh, is all they need to like them. Fair enough. Industrialists and Alchemist Union. Careful cooperation. The alchemists don't fully trust the industrialists, afraid of, not for, persecution. The industrialists have great respect for the alchemists, though they still act with great care. Okay? Alchemist union to gray cloaks. And, and then back, right? And vice versa. Careful cooperation again. The alchemists are glad the gray cloaks have never sold them out, but still treat them warily, making sure to leave as little to chance as they can. The gray cloaks don't fully understand the alchemists, and a lack of knowledge is what they fear most. But they know the alchemists mean profit, and that they appreciate. It's pretty cool, Bob. Overall, I like it. I think it's uh, it's complex. I just think there's some issues you've got to flesh out a bit, work on to, you know, kind of, you know, figure out the how and why behind, right? But otherwise, excellent. And your th thoughts there, Sarah, if any? No, oh, I agree. I mean, it's... I would definitely be interested in learning more. Um, it's pretty well put together. You know, there's obviously some details. And, you know, I mean, the, the thing with world building is there is so much nuance. It, it's, you know, it's always good to run things by people because, you know, you, you end up with a social or a sociologist who sits there and goes, uh, that's not how that works. Or you get a plumber who's like, yeah. uh, no. you know, so it, but yeah, you know, the, it's, it's those details that we're, we're constantly having to tweak that I think we're really focused on right now because the overall concept is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested and I would like to know more about your world. Right. If you were writing fiction in it, I would read it. I would check it out. Okay, guys. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah, for joining me today. This was a true pleasure. If you ever want to do this again, you know, let me know because this was great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> check out Sarah's oh, channel, you. by the way, Author Goddess, twitch.tv slash Author Goddess. Right. Also, she's on social media, authorgoddess.com, to kind of be the heart of all of her stuff. Read rune spells. It's fucking amazing. Uh, it's like American Gods meets the Dresden Files. It's amazing. Right. Uh, I wrote that blurb. I mean it. <laughs> right. So, yes. Oh, and I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Thanks so much for joining me. We're way late. Black Maggot is live. We're going to go there right now on our raid. So don't forget that the raid shout is prepare to be boarded because we are the Sables Privateers. I uh, just got to learn to type, apparently. Oh, honey. Shh. All right. And we'll see you again next week. Next week is supposed to be more plotting stuff. I have no idea what we'll do, but I will come up with something. <laughs> Bye, everyone.